Today, I'd like to ask you, what do you think of when you hear the word invasive species? Everybody pictures something different. I can tell you the first thing that comes to my mind are cats, which is Felis domesticus, domestic house cats. It's got to be like the easiest scientific name, um, except maybe bison bison, which is the scientific name for bison. And the reason I think of cats is because they've been a part of my life for as long as I can remember. When I was four, I moved to a farm, and we arrived and there was a barn fully stocked with kittens. And some of my best memories were dressing my cats up in clothes, pushing them around in little strollers. I even dropped one out of the second story of a barn to test the whole cat landing on its feet theory. Um, I got in a lot of trouble. The cat was fine, it was unharmed, and I haven't become a serial killer, so. That's good news. <laughs> Despite this torture that I put my poor little kittens through, they actually were really nice and they would give me gifts all the time. Um, they were feathered and furry, and sometimes they were on my mat, sometimes they'd drop them inside my shoes, even bring them to my bed sometimes. And they were usually dead, but sometimes they were alive. <laughs> and so, as I grew up on the farm, the cats did too. You can see some of my five-year-old scrapbooking skills here. <laughs> And when I left the farm and went to college, my life was suddenly extremely deprived of animals. And I had grown up my whole life surrounded by all kinds of animals. Ended up changing my major a few times and decided to study zoology. And that's when I started learning about ecology and the environment. And then my senior year, I took an ornithology class, which is the study of birds. And I got really into it. I was really excited and it just drew me in like none of my other classes had. But when I found out that my very own Fluffernutter, Ringle Bell, Puffy, Miss Katie, et cetera, all my kittens growing up were contributing to the 2.4 billion bird deaths every year just in the US, which is the number one cause of non-natural avian deaths, I was horrified. I felt very conflicted. And after school, I had an opportunity to get my first pet of my own. My friend found a bunch of stray kittens and asked me if I wanted one, and I said yes, without hesitation. And she FaceTimed me, and I was supposed to be able to pick out which kitten I wanted. But it turns out my cat was the only one they could catch. She was the friendliest. And this was the beginning of my crazy cat lady phase. So I knew a lot about wild birds, I knew the harm that cats could do, and I knew my cat was not going to eat wild birds. She was going to strictly bird-free diet, indoors, but she really wanted to go outside and I felt bad, so I bought her a harness and I bought her a little leash and I took my cat on walks around my very urban neighborhood and I got a lot of weird looks. <laughs> but um, once she grew up, I also grew in my passion for wild birds and decided to go to school. So Basil and I packed up our bags, we moved across the country and unfortunately she died very young um, from a condition called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy which just means her heart was too big. However, in her short life, and all the cats before her in my life, she taught me a lot about my feelings on invasive species, how I could both love an invasive species and love one of the prey animals that they kill and are a huge problem. So this got me thinking, what is the most invasive species? I'm not here to talk to you about cats the whole time, sorry. <laughs> It's actually not domestic cats, it's humans. It's all of us, homo sapiens. We are the most invasive species. We've been moving across the planet, transforming its surface, plundering its resources for thousands of years. And we're also the ones that bring invasive species to new places. We fly them, we ship them, and we do it on purpose, we do it by accident, we bring them for food, um, and we're the ones responsible for all of these species being distributed across the planet. We even enlist the help of other animals to help us with this problem. This is a dog trained with a handler to sniff and kill brown tree snakes on the landing gear of planes so that they don't get transported to new countries because they've decimated Guam's native bird and reptile populations and they wanna make sure they don't continue to spread. So we are the most invasive species. We also cause all these other invasive species. We define also what counts and what doesn't, and which invasive species we care about and do things about and which we don't. These organisms don't have borders. They're not choosing to come to these new places. 
It depends on, it can, might just be a few miles over, it might be a state over, or it might be an entirely different country that these organisms come from. When I talk about caring about some and not others, usually if you tell someone, you know, there's this invasive bug, would you mind if you see it? Would you have any problem stepping on it? Most people would have no problem. I understand, I can take care of that. But if you tell them things like, wild horses are invasive, they're taking over certain areas of the world and they're doing a lot of destruction and you wanna reduce their populations, people are gonna be really upset. So we need to talk a little bit more about how these invasive species get here because I've made it sound like it's really easy and you know, we've been doing it a long time, but it's actually very difficult. So the likelihood that a species is gonna be picked up and transported to a new place is pretty low. And once it gets there, it's in a harsh new environment, it's very unlikely that it'll actually survive. And after it survives, it has to establish and then continue to spread and take over. So it's actually very difficult and there's many barriers in the way. However, we have been doing this for a very long time, so it does build up. But if, for example, you take a seed, from a different country, you drop it in your garden. There's really only about a 1% chance or less that that is going to establish and take over. That was just a little example. I don't want you to go home and do that. <laughs> I get in a lot of trouble. So it is difficult to establish, but it's a very big problem now. There's up to 1.5 new invasive species introduced every day. It costs over $1.3 trillion in the last 50 years to try to mitigate these problems that the invasive species have caused. There's more than 40,000 endangered animals right now. Sorry, not just animals, organisms. And that's about 23% of all of the organisms that they've assessed. So it's, it's a big deal, and invasive species are a big problem because um, they're competing for these spaces that are shrinking and shrinking. And unfortunately, they've been here so long, certain invasive species can't be eradicated. They can't be removed from the population. It might do more harm than good in some cases because they've become such a close-knit part of the environment. We also don't have the money and the resources and the people and manpower to tackle all of these invasive species. The only way we'd be able to fix all of these problems is if we had a time machine and we went back to the before humans have transformed the earth the way they have. Total eradication is not possible. But in the pursuit of progress, not all hope is lost if we don't consider that the only solution. There's a lot of other things that, are, that we can do that are proven to be successful. We can stop introducing new invasive species. We can tackle isolated populations. We can take advantage of new technology like biocontrol and harness the power of other organisms that can select and eliminate these invasive species. And so we have all of these resources. We have a worldwide industry that works on this. We have billions of dollars in research. Even local governments collaborate to discourage bad practices. With this very big problem and all of these creative solutions, the biggest solution and the biggest impact is none of those. It's actually all of us, all of you in the audience, everyone, that can make the biggest impact on invasive species by taking three simple steps, see it, snap it, and report it. What I mean by that is, you see something that seems strange, seems off, we're overwhelmed by stimulus these days, but listen to the little voice in the back of your head, pause a moment, and then take a photo. We take a photo of what we eat for breakfast, you can take a photo of an invasive species. And it's okay if you're wrong, it's not a big deal. Everyone knows a picture's worth a thousand words, and this is definitely true with taking photos of invasive species. It documents so much, it can provide so much evidence, and it's so easy for us to do. There are so many of us that if all of us did something simple like this and then reported it, it could make a huge impact. Reporting it somewhere like invasivespeciesinfo.gov. There's a lot of things going on in the world right now that are very stressful and overwhelming, and they weigh on us and we feel like we need to do something about it. Well, we are not responsible for solving all of these problems by ourselves. It is not our responsibility. What we can do is take small acts 
like see it, snap it, and report it. And that can have a tremendous impact in this battle and this fight against invasive species. Thank you.